started running. All right, so welcome to everyone and thanks for showing up. My name is uh, Sergio Elmar. I was here last, last year, actually. I'm not sure how many of you were in my last talk. Some of you, All right, great. So today we're gonna talk about the Spring Boot. We're gonna see a little bit about the new features in Spring Boot 1.3. How many of you use Spring Boot right now? Half of the room. How many of you use Spring? How many of you came for the beers? <laughs> Great. Awesome. <laughs> All right, so before getting started, um, I also want to make an announcement. So I'm the organizer of the Spring IO conference. It's basically uh, the biggest European conference in spring, so entirely for the spring uh, ecosystem. It's going to happen in Barcelona. Uh, that's my hometown. That's where I'm based. And uh, that's going to be the 19th and 20th of May. We just opened the call for papers. So if you have something interesting to say, share. Just feel, fr feel free to go to springio.net and just send your proposal. So I'm, I'm just going to pass a quick video on last year edition. So it's a, like a two minute video, right? So, but at least you'll be able to see how it was. A great pleasure for me to see Spring.io reappearing as a European conference. And the choice of Barcelona is just a perfect fit. Um, very nice atmosphere here, international mix of attendees. potential for a spring conference in Europe is uh, just enormous uh, and uh, there really should be a yearly spring event in Europe again and this is a perfect choice. Here at Spring I.O. 2015 in beautiful Barcelona, Spain, having a great time, some of the best developers in the world, leading experts on spring, uh, groovy cloud um, products and stuff like that. Uh, really getting a chance to talk to some of the best developers around, great talks, enjoying the conference. It's really the biggest conference in Europe where you can meet Spring people. And in particular, the Spring, the engineering team, the people who actually write the software. Uh, Sergi is amazing, he knows everybody. constant feedback, there's constant, um, every, everyone's asking questions, um, uh, obviously there's, there's most of the spring crew here so it's, it's great to catch up with the, the guys. I've learned a lot actually, I've learned a lot just talking to uh, users of the technology, people out there in the community. Uh, it's been a very, very good conference, I'm really quite pleased, I, I, sh I, I hope this becomes sort of the de facto spring experience in Europe, it's, it's amazing. This event has proven to be an incredible success because it has drawn people from all over continental Europe, and I mean all over, from the northernmost and the easternmost borders. It's a really great place um, and a really great conference to, um, to see everybody. Uh, spring I.O. in one or two words, uh, it's a superb conference. I mean, it's, it, it's the spring event of, of Europe. Right, so that was it, right? So basically, uh, this year again, right? So if you are into the Spring community, I'd say feel, well, you should attend either Spring IO or Spring One in the US, which is basically the two main conferences to meet the Spring ecosystem of Spring people. All right, so having said that, uh, let's get started. So we come from, long time ago, right? So actually, a Spring, the, the first version, the first milestone came out 
back in 2004. Right? In 2006, we had a really nice improvement on the XML configuration because we had the namespaces added to the XML configuration, which simplified quite a lot the configuration. But still, right, XML is quite verbose and error prone. It's not type safe. Right? So back in 2007, when Spring 2.5 was introduced, the MVC layer was completely uh, renewed and refactored to use annotation. So we see something like request mapping, request pattern, and those annotations, this kind of uh, programming model is the programming model that we still use today. Right? In 2009, when Spring 3 was released, we introduced a new configuration style, which is called the Java config. Right? And that's basically what Spring Boo uh, is using mainly, right? So the Java, the Java configuration style instead of the XMLs, right? Annotations, right? So we have three ways of configuring uh, Spring, basically Java, XML, and annotations. We're going to see that Spring Boot goes more into the in the in the Java side. In Spring 3.1, the profiles were introduced as well, and this is a really this was a really nice addition to uh, the framework because. Profiles allow, allow us to basically have a configuration for different environments. So you could have, for instance, a data source for testing, for uh, production, for QA, right? So you could configure a bin differently depending on the environment where you were. And finally, version one of Spring Boot came out in 2014, right? It, it just happened that Spring Boot had like uh, really good traction, right? So a really good ad adoption as well. And we're going to see that in the next slide because Spring Boot happens to be like one of the most downloaded frameworks. I would say this is the most downloaded framework for microservices as well. So what's a Spring Boot? Spring Boot is basically an opinionated, opinionated runtime for a Spring projects. So that means that we're going to rely on conventions of our configuration, right? So it's basically uh, Spring Boot will basically configure sev several parts of your application based on some defaults or some things that you have in the class path, some properties, right? So no XML anymore, right? so everything will be in Java. No code generation. So how many of you use Spring Roo here in the room? Mm -hmm. Some of you, right? So Spring Roo was all, all about code generation. Spring Boot is something completely different. It's basically what brings the fun back again to the Spring framework. Right? So it's the fun way to develop a Spring. So if you have like a greenfield uh, uh, development, so if you start a project from scratch, you should definitely check out Spring Boot. You should start with a Spring Boot. So it supports many types of uh, applications like web applications, integration applications, cloud, apl cloud applications, batch applications. And it basically removes all the boilerplate configuration. So you or actually, the framework can predict more or less what you're going to be using. So if you have a web application, for sure, you need a servlet container. Or you need Jackson because you'll be dealing with JSON. Right? So all these can be predicted. So Spring Boot will try to predict all this stuff and how to configure the different parts of, of your application. So who's using Spring Boot? So if we see this, uh, this graph here, here, we see that last month in December, Spring Boot broke the barrier of 2 million downloads. Right? So that's quite a lot. And this is the most downloaded framework for microservices as well. So Spring Boot is basically the way to go. And if we take a look at this uh, picture here, we see that at the top level, level in, uh, the in the application framework level, we find a Spring Cloud and Spring Boot. So if you're into a microservice uh, architecture, Spring Cloud, Spring Boot, and Cloud Foundry is the perfect uh, combination. So how many of you heard about Spring Cloud here? Mm -hmm. right. Some of you. Um, we're, we're not going to talk about Spring Cloud today, maybe some other day. Right? But uh, Spring Boot, or actually Spring Cloud, is based on a Spring Boot. And it's actually the perfect fit for a an, an, uh, microservice architecture. So we're going to focus on this layer, layer here, basically on the application framework, where we see that Spring Boot will give us the, uh, uh, basically the rapid development. Right? So how to get from zero to a complete app in five minutes. And Spring Cloud will give us all the tools for when, whenever you want to build a uh, distributed system, so it's going to give you all the patterns 
implemented for distributed systems, which are quite, com quite complex, right? And you're going to see that Spring Boot plus Spring Cloud will give you like a microservice architecture, right? In just nothing, in a simple minute. So um, just to be on the same page, we're going to do a quick demo on a Spring Boot. We're going to just start a, a Spring Boot project. We're going to use this Spring Boot project for uh, the new features in Spring, in Spring Boot 1.3. So basically, I am using the STS. I'm going to start a new, a new project. Hopefully, the Wi-Fi will behave properly. So SG Boot Demo. And I'm going to choose that I want a Gradle project. How many of you use Gradle here? Mm, not much, huh? Most of you, Maven? Almost all the room. <laughs> Time to check out Gra Gradle as well. SG, put uh, demo, and SG does this again. All right, so notice the packaging here. We're going to build a web application but we're going to package it as a jar file, right? So in a traditional um, approach, you would choose a WAR file. Well, let's call it traditional or old-fashioned as you want, right? But we're going to make the jar uh, and not the WAR, like just long says, right? So we're going to package a, uh, a jar file, and this jar file will have an embedded container, so it will expose itself to HTTP. So we're going to choose the boot version, so I'm going to uh, take some risks. I'm going to take the snapshot, current snapshot. And notice how we can choose from a lot of uh, flavors. I'm going to choose the web flavor plus the actuator, actuator flavor plus time leaf. But we see that we have a lot for, uh, to choose from. We have uh, from core uh, components to data access components from uh, Cloud components, so we're going to keep it simple, right? A real simple application. I'm going to, we're going to start with a simple web application. So notice how we are connecting with start.spring.io. That was fast, right? So start.spring.io is uh, basically a website that you should know about. So it's basically another way to start a Spring uh, Boot project. So it basically has the same features that I've just shown you. And this will create a zip file. So you're going to have a Maven or Gradle project with the dependencies that uh, you chose. So we have already the, the project here. So we're going to start um, the project. And we see that we have a uh, main class. Right? So it's nothing fancy annotated with Spring Boot uh, application. And we're going to create a, uh, let's call it a controller, a, a web application. So I'm going to create a controller. And I'm going to define a, an endpoint, request mapping, uh, create, for instance, a string, uh, say hi. And I'm going to pass a request parameter, sorry, called name. How many of you use uh, Java 8? Happy days. All right. Great. So I have my endpoint. Um, I have a really anonymous, if I know how to spell it. Great. So I have an endpoint called greet. It expects um, opsh opsh optional. I didn't choose Java 8, maybe. Mm, that's Java 8, yes. So you're going to use the REST controller? Um, I wanted to create an, an endpoint with time leaf. So that's why I choose a, a controller. But yeah, as Michael said, you could use a REST controller. All right. Here, that's another option. It was introduced in Spring 4. All right. But for now, I'm going to use the REST controller. And I'm going to define here require a response body. All right. All right. Great. And this guy here is complaining because of, you know, I don't know why it's complaining here. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Uh, why did you come here? OK, great. Happy days. So this is the only thing that I need to get 
an application up and running. So notice that I haven't configured any time with it. I haven't configured anything in, uh, in Spring. I just have a started class, and I can just start it as a normal application. So I can just go run it as a Spring Boot application. This will start in some seconds. To start it, I can go to localhost 8080 slash greet. Greet. And well, it's telling me, hi, Anonymous. If I pass a name like Sergi, which is my name, it's telling me, hi, Sergi. Right? So quite a straightforward. No configuration. And that's what Spring Boot is all about. Right? Great. So if we take a look at the uh, new features of Spring Boot 1.3, uh, which is the current release, um, Spring Boot 1.3 is based on Spring Framework 4.2. So that means that this is the requirement. If you're, if you're using Spring 3, right, then you won't be able to use Spring Boot 1.3. It's also uh, using Spring Security 4. So if you choose to use Spring Security 4, uh, Spring Security, it will take the version 4. And imagine or not, the most successful feature in Spring Boot 1.3 have been the colorful <laughs> art <laughs> banners. Right? So that's why I just put it here in the first uh, thing. So if you're not aware of, of that, um, when I start the application, I have this really nice banner here that you can overwrite. Right? So you can overwrite by creating a file. No, not this one here. I'm going to create a file called banner.txt. And um, you can go to uh, online. Uh, online uh, CRs check. I use that quite a lot. <coughs> well, I'm just going to grab it from here. I have it. So, so this is the uh, uh, the ACR that I just created. All right. So now, when I start the application, I should see this ASCII art right, yeah, on my console. It just happens that my Console is not configured to show colors, but in Spring Boot 1.3, you can have colorful um, banners. So I can just uh, go to the console just to show you just real quick. And that's going to be SG Boot Demo. I'm just going to um, create a build in just a second. And we're going to see it in, on the console in just a second. So that's just, just a joke, but it's true that a lot of people were interested in, in this feature. Right? Um, Java minus jar. And I'm going to choose this here. So notice how I start the application. I start the application using Java minus jar. So there's no Tomcat here. So uh, Spring Boot will pull in an embedded Tomcat, and it will start the application with the embedded Tomcat. So I can have. Uh, an executable jar with Java minus jar. And we see here that now we have colors in the ASCII banner. OK, great. So let's go for the interesting stuff or the serious stuff. Because the um, I would say that the uh, most interesting feature in 1.3 is the developer tools. So the developer tools will give you a lot of productivity right, on the development of your Spring Boot applications. So it will provide some sensible property defaults. I'm going to talk about that in a second. It will provide automatic application restart, remote development support, live reload support, and uh, persistent HTTP sessions. So let's do a demo on that on every single topic, and let's see what that means. So I'm going to take the same application in here. And uh, if I go to the browser, and I localhost 8080. Uh, yeah, great. Here you go. And if I just want to change something in here, hi there, what happens is that I have to restart the application to see the changes, right? So I, can, I have to go here, and I have to restart the application, wait some time until the application is uh, deployed again. Well, uh, I have to close this one here. So let's uh, do it again. So I have to wait some time until I see the changes. Let's put that in here. All right, so I, now I kind of refresh, and I've got to see the changes. So 
I'm going to introduce a new dependency, which is the dev tools. So the dependency in Spring Boot is usually a starter project. Notice that the main dependencies are just these four here. And these four here will pull in all the dependencies required for uh, my application to run. So I'm going to add a new dependency, which is the, uh, the dev tool tools. I'm going to add it here. And I'm going to uh, refresh the project. Cradle, refresh all. And this will pull in uh, the dev tools. So now we're going to we're going to get some nice features. I'm going to stop the current application here. And I'm going to start it again. So hopefully this will run with dev tools now. All right, it's running here. But uh, notice how if I change something, there's an automatic restart. Have you seen that in here? Let me do it again. Right, so it has started now. So hey, back. I'm going to save and see the restart happening here. Okay, so I can come here and just see the uh, updated values. And you say, okay, so it's it's just a restart, but it's not a restart. So let's see what a restart is and what Spring DevTools is doing. So I'm going to restart using the IDE, OK? So if I click that button here, it's going to restart the application. So I'm going to click that. I'm going to check the console. And I'm going to check the time that it took to start the application. It took five seconds. All right? Can you see, see that? So let's do a change here. And let's see how long it ta takes to start. Bank, one second, right? How is that possible? Because Spring Boot DevTools is creating two class loaders. There's a root class loader with all your dependencies. So whenever you start the application, the class loader needs to, to, uh, to load all the classes into it. So Spring Boot has a root class loader with all your dependencies, all your jar files, the classes in your jar, jar files that won't change. And it has a kind of child class loader. And in this child class loader, you will find your classes, your application classes. So whenever there's a restart, only the child class loader gets refreshed and not the root class loader. So that's why we get a significant improvement in the uh, reload of the application. So that's not a restart. It's actually a reloading. Right? So, and actually, it's a really nice feature. But as we are changing the application, we're going to see the changes reflected into my browser. But there's, there's even more, right? If I can get that into here, why I don't see it? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. <coughs> Let me see if I can see that. Da -da -da -da. Uh, where where have you gone? It was oh, wait, here. You go. It's in here. Here you go. So what I'm gonna do is to enable something called the live reload. Right? So that's basically uh, creating a live reload server. So apart from reloading the application, what I will see now is that these uh, changes are going to be reflected to my browser automatically without having to refresh my browser. So I'm going to just type hi there here. And I'm going to see that this has refreshed. And I see the changes automatically in here. I haven't refreshed the page at all. Right, so that had happened automatically for me. So this is just a REST uh, call. But imagine that I have a normal request. Let's call it grid2. A normal request using uh, like a timely, for instance. Public string, say, hi2. I'm going to pass the same parameters here. Yeah. Here. Da -da -da. And a model, right? So in a traditional application, we have a model, which is the contract between the controller and the, um, and the view. And I'm going to add to the model the uh, attribute name. Sorry. Name or else anonymous, all right? 
And I'm going to return a view which is going to be grid, for instance. So Spring Boot, if you use any of the templating frameworks, will expect the templates to be under the template directory. So I'm going to create a new file into the template directory called grid.html. I'm going to cheat a little bit and get my template, my timeless template that I had. So I have the name here. And I'm going to start the application again and see that I get access to this page. So grid2. So grid2 actually um, renders this application here. Right? So if I change the HTML here, I'm going to see that this has changed as well. So the reloading not only happens to the Java classes, but it also happens to the static resources. So I see that this is a time leaf um, file. And this gets also refreshed right, when I change something in here to the browser automatically. So the Spring Dev tools for time leaf um, basically gets rid get reads of the cache. Timeleaf provides a cache, so whenever you render a template, this template is cached. So if you make any change to the template, you won't see anything on the, uh, on the browser because it has been cached. Even if you refresh it, there are no changes applied on the browser side. So that tools will basically get rid of these um, caches if you are in development mode. Right? So that's one of the features that the uh, dev tools will give you. Apart from that, you can do the same thing with remote applications. So imagine that you take this application and you push it into Cloud Foundry. How many of you know about Cloud Foundry? Some of you. Right, so Cloud Foundry is basically a pass where you can deploy your uh, applications. So if you take this uh, application and deploy it into Cloud Foundry, you can even get the same uh, feature. Right? So you can have the uh, automatic changes and the automatic reload in a remote location. Right? So that also happens right, remotely, not only in, uh, local, locally here. If we have time, we're going to cover it. But I think that we are kind of, we have more 15 minutes or? Yeah, 15. OK. Let's continue, and uh, let's see if we have more time later on. Right. So next thing that um, Spring Boot 1.3 is providing is out of configuration for the caching layer. So Spring Boot has a caching abstraction la layer. So you can use some abstra abstraction for caching and use any cache implementation underneath, which can be uh, EHCache, could be um, Heiselcast, could be Redis, could be any of the implementations of the GSR 107, could be anything. Right? So you basically use some annotations in your application, and Spring uh, will basically define something called the cache manager, which will be packed by one of these cache technologies. So in Spring Boot 1.4, you can have caching uh, with a simple annotation. Just by providing some of the dependencies into the uh, class path, Spring Boot will auto-configure a cache for you. So let's see how this works. So we're going to um, create a class here, which will be the greeter. And we're going to create a simple, um, stop that, a simple method, public string um, uh, greet message. A really simple um, class. I'm going to annotate it with component. And I'm going to use it in, in here. So never do that. All right, I'm going to use this guy here, and I'm going to apply a cache on this guy. So now instead of this, I'm going to uh, call the greeter dot uh, greet message. Okay, great. So this greeter will be a really, really slow guy, or maybe we can do a sys, sys out, so it's going to be easier. I'm in. 
So I'm going to uh, use caching on, uh, in here so we don't have to go into the method over and over again. So imagine that this method takes a lot of time to execute. So I can use some uh, annotations like cacheable, cacheable to say that this method can be cacheable. And the way that this will be cached depends on how you configure your application uh, context. It could be cached by Redis. It could be cached by uh, Hazelcast. It could be cached by anything. Right? So I'm going to add a cache like message. That's the name of the cache. A cache could be a simple concurrent hash map as well. Right? So it could be anything. Right? So I'm going to uh, add a cache. And I'm going to um, set Redis as the cache implementation. So how can we make the cache work without almost zero configuration? So the first thing that we'll do is to add some dependencies into my project. Actually, I'm going to add a dependency called cache, the starter cache, and a dependency called starter redis. So this will pull in all the required dependencies for caching and for redis. So only two dependencies. They are going to be in my class path. And Spring Boot will auto detect them and will just know that Spring Boot can use redis as a cache implementation. So I'm going to update my project, gradle uh, refresh all. And I'm going to add a simple annotation called add enable caching. Has been a long day. All right, so this annotation at, at enable caching, it will enable the uh, cache layer based on the dependencies that I have in my class path. So I'm going to start now my application. And I'm going to call the greet method. Right? So we see here that we got this uh, system out called I'm in. Right? So that was the first uh, time we called it. Second time, third time, fourth time. So we see that only one time I'm in was called. Right? So that means that the cache applied. We haven't called that method multiple times. And we can actually check whether that's true or not. Right? So I can go to Redis, and I can check the keys of Redis. And I see that the second key is actually the anonymous. So this part here is actually done by Spring Data. It's because of the ser Java serialization. Right? But uh, you can change that. But at least we see that this is the key that we just uh, uh, cached. So if I can come to, if I go to the, um, the endpoint again, and I change the parameter, greet name equals Sergi. So that's another value. Right? So we see that we got into the method from the greeter. But if I just hit the endpoint multiple times now, we see that only one time I mean was shown in the console. You can go to Redis again, and we see that there's another entry called Sergi right? in here. So that means that this value was cached into Redis. So one annotation, two extra dependencies, and we got cached work, caching working right, in our application. And that works for Hazelcast and uh, well, a bunch of uh, cache implementations, the ones that we have seen on the slides. Right? It just happens that we use Redis, but this works for um, many implementations. More stuff, more auto configuration for Cassandra, for Spring Session, for OAuth, for uh, Jog, for SendGrid, for Termi Artemis. We're not going to show all of them, right? all the auto configuration. But um, well, the same that we have seen for caching works for all these different technologies. How many of you heard about the Spring Session? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow, so there's a lot to do eh? when you go at home. <laughs> so. Spring session, five minutes only. Wow. Spring session basically uh, lets you externalize the HTTP session into Redis, Hazelcast. Right? So currently, we have these two implementations. But at least, you will have like portable HTTP sessions. So if you have your uh, application and it dies, your 
uh, session repository won't die along, right? So and that's especially important in the cloud environment where you have different containers and those containers can be disposed, can be recreated, right? So you cannot rely on the uh, default strategy for session persistence, right? So you need to externalize the state into an external repository. So let's take a look at how this works. Uh, we're going to do it real quick, right? I have a second project here configured and this second project has a really simple um, endpoint with a counter, right? So it basically uh, gets a counter from the session, session updates it, and shows the counter. counter. So let's uh, start this uh, project here. <clears throat> okay. Localhost 8080. It has some security in it. So no, that's not the credential search. G123. Right. So we have here the counter. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right. So it, it just happens that if you have like a load balancer and multiple instances of this application uh, deployed, if you have sticky sessions, well, you're going to go to the same uh, um, instance of the application. But in the cloud, for instance, if this instance dies for some reason, because maybe you scale down or scale up, your session is gone as well. So the, the only uh, way to maintain the state is by externalizing this state into a uh, external repository. So Spring Session allows you to do that by simply, um, where am I? Here we go. Well, Spring Boot and Spring Session allows you to do that by simply adding one dependency, which is this one here, Spring Session, right? So Spring Boot 1.3 uh, will detect that you have a Spring Session in the class path, and it will also detect that you have Redis in the class path. So if you have these two dependencies in the class path, we'll automatically, automatically configure your application to store all the HTTP state directly into Redis. Notice that you don't have to change anything on your application side. On your, your application side, you still use the servlet API components. I'm using the HTTP session, but it just happens that Spring Boot, uh, Spring Session, will wrap the HTTP request, and whenever you get a, a session and store something into the session, we'll store it into a Spring Session, a Spring uh, Session repository, which could be Redis, could be Hazelcast. Right, so if I call, go to uh, the CLI here and I do keys star, I see that I got some keys from my sessions. Right, so these sessions be, basically belong to the session I just started. So if I go back to this uh, uh, URL, I can keep on refreshing 9, 10, 11. This endpoint is protected. It has a session. Right? So notice how if I flush everything from Redis, so now Redis is empty, and I refresh this endpoint, I'm brought back to the login page because there's no session. I just killed my session because all my session uh, state was on Redis. It was externalized. Right? So this is a quite nice feature. Another feature is a fully executable jar files. So as you have seen before, I started the application using Java minor jar, right? So this uh, jar file is a Uber jar, which contains not only your application code, but also all the dependencies. So notice that this jar file is quite big, right? Compared to the original jar file. The original jar file has only your application code, but the Uber jar file contains everything. So we just started the jar file using Java minus jar, but in Spring Boot, what you can do is to execute the jar file like a normal script. So to do that, you'll have to change slightly your um, build, I'm going to add these lines here, Spring Boot executable equals true, and now I'm going to rebuild the uh, application again. Gradle build, this will generate another jar file. Let me stop this guy. <clears throat> And now, if I check these uh, jar files, I will start the jar file. Uh, why not? Mm. Uh, 
watch it what let's see if that works mm -mm. able to access the jar file mm -mm -mm. oh I added that into the Spring Boot session that was not the project so let me just uh, add it again here rebuild it sorry rebuild it and this is a really um, good feature because mm -hmm. you can just add your application into uh, the init scripts for instance you can create a symbolic link to the init script and just make your application start when your uh, server starts as well so let's see if that works now it doesn't work it doesn't like it to work so mm -mm -mm. we're on the right project mm -hmm. how aren't we mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you have to trust me on that right now. <laughs> oh, I have two of them. So we'll have to trust me on that by now. But um, yeah, what it generates is that if you take a look at the, the jar file, the first part of the jar file is a bash script that will make the jar uh, automatically start with dot slash and the, the name of the jar file. Let's keep it in the background. There are actually more features on a Spring Boot 1.3, so I guess that these were the most important ones, the developer tools, the caching, auto configuration, uh, all the other configuration, the Spring Session configuration, the full executable jars. Um, actually, we have also support for uh, auto configuration of web servlets, web filters, and web listeners. If you have a class in, uh, with these annotations and we use the servlet component scan annotation, these will be automatically picked up. And there are actually a lot more um, um, features in Spring Boot 1.3, minor features, which we're not going to cover. So if you're, ex if you're currently using Spring Boot 1.2, for instance, and you want to migrate to 1.3, there are uh, some properties that have been renamed. So make sure that you're not using one of them, otherwise they won't work. Also, Spring Boot uh, chooses the versions of the dependencies for you. Right? That means that if you're using the core, in Spring Boot 1.3, you'll upgrade to Spring, Boot, uh, Spring Framework 4.3, right? So this happens for all your dependencies or for most of the dependencies. So make sure that your application is happy with the upgrading of it, these dependencies as well. So you can, you can check these release notes where, and you're gonna find the migration path and all the features that came out in Spring Boot 1.3. If you look into the future, Spring Boot 1.4, is planned, is scheduled strategically to feed the Spring I.O. conference, right? <laughs> so Spring Boot 1.4 will be released by those days, just before the Spring I.O. conference. Spring I.O. conference is uh, May 19th. So if you want to get the state of the art of the Spring ecosystem, make sure to make it to Barcelona. It's a nice place. <laughs> it's not as hot as here, but you, um, you agree that well, it will, it will be a better weather than here in terms of being less hot, right? And um, yeah, the next release of Spring, uh, Spring 5, or actually the major release, is scheduled for 2016, right? actually this year, the end of the year. So it has comprehensive support for Java 9. The baseline will be Java 8. So if you're not using Java 8 yet, you should start using Java 8, right? Because all the baseline in Spring 5 will be based on Java 8. So we, we can use all the Java 8 features. All right, so more Silver 3 stuff, HTTP 2 and reactive support. That will be one of the uh, most important features in Spring 5, right? The reactive support. If you can, check a project called Spring Reactive, which is basically the initial effort on the reactive support for a Spring 5. Right, so it's on GitHub already, so make sure to check um, a sp the Spring Reactive project. All right, so I think that uh, I made it in 45 yeah. minutes. All right, yeah. so thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh.